Bishop. Bishop. Y'all, look, I have the GOAT on bandwidth tonight. Y'all, I need you to do me a favor, like, share, tag. Let everybody know that the GOAT, Dr. Brian Keith, look, y'all, Bishop, I love you. I love you too so much, man. Thank you for One, coming, sir. 100. Anything for you. Sir, uh, anything for me, right? Anything. Yeah. You got to take that, uh, that, that, that rich man off. It, it's Almost anything. <laughs> Congratulations on crossing, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, man. T tell, tell me about that. That you just crossed. What happened? Like, so I've always wanted to be a part of the D nine. Yes, sir. And um, I've always had friends who were in one of the major fraternal organizations or sorority organizations, and so uh, my late friend Bishop Stephen Hall and I had a conversation about it one day mm -hmm. and we were supposed to start together. And I just going, started going through a whirlwind of things that I needed to back away. And he told me, he said, promise me you will. And I told him I would. And um, he passed away. Yes, sir. Congratulations. I'm very sir. thankful. I'm very proud to be a part of the wondrous band of the Phi Beta Sigma <laughs> Fraternity Incorporated. They are a wonderful group of brothers. Yes, sir. They are very, very much so. Uh, steeped in the tradition of culture for service and service for humanity and they love it they do it and they represent it well and they don't do it for photo ops they're mm -hmm. grounded in there and I could say that for much of the D9 yes, sir. that these are wonderful institutions who love what they do and you know we have that st that kind of sibling rivalry if, in yeah, right, 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 right. but the truth is the D9 loves yes, 100 sir. yeah now, now, this is not the topic tonight, but I do want to ask you this question because. For, for yes, about, yes, we'll accept you as a sigma. <laughs> yes, we'll accept, we'll accept you as a sigma. We will. Is that what you wanted to ask? Uh, that's will not we? what I wanted to ask. Uh, no, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to ask this, though. You know, I grew up, and some of the things you heard about pledging is, you know, it was demonic or it's not godly or you know what 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 would you say to that my my experience has been absolutely wonderful mm -hmm. it it helped me to learn a number of things about the actual institution mm -hmm. it helped me understand things about the organizations that um are part of the d9 it helped me to understand real purpose of brotherhood mm -hmm. and so there, there are people who uh say it's demonic but they really don't know yeah. and ignorance sometimes can produce mass misconceptions yes, sir. and so no my experience has been amazing and i'm grateful for the experience i had wow that's phenomenal bishop so i I know I only have a few minutes with you. I want to ask you this question. Okay. Uh, there's this, um, in the church, there's this stigma about divorce and um, God don't like divorce mm -hmm. and all of those things that we've heard over the years. Uh, since I have you here, before we talk about divorce, how how do you know when you've met the right one? Oh, really good question. Really good question. I think you know that you've met the right one and the person you want to marry. And my, let me just warn you, I don't have conventional thinking when it comes to this. Yeah. So you won't hear me say, Lord told me to marry this person. Okay. You won't hear me say, that's my soulmate. Yeah. No, no, you won't hear me say that. Okay. So let me tell you what I believe are essential things that people who are in love and will stay in love, that they'll have. Number one, they'll have passion. Mm -hmm. And that passion is an exclusive passion. I want to be with this person and this person only. Mm -hmm. Certainly monogamy plays a humongous part in that. I want to be with that. And I see them as the person that I want in my life. But then when you really have that passion, the next level is permission. You give the person that you are passionately in love with permission to challenge you in your life, challenge you to be better, mm -hmm. challenge you to think differently, right? Yes, sir. Let's say uh, a, a sister sees a man that she's in love with and he gives her that permission. She'll say to him, I see you going down the dark path. You got to stop drinking. And he says to her, I will. And he honors that commitment. That's permission. We keep thinking that because a person asks you to do something and you do it, then you're henpecked or you're whipped. Not at all. That's called love. Mm. When you love someone, 
and they see something that could hurt you or is deleterious for you or will cause you some irreparable harm, they have the permission from you to say, stop, and you will. You're not in love and you ain't ready for the next level if a person can tell you to stop and you don't. One of the first lessons I learned as a young clergy personality was that real submission is when you're asked to do something you don't want to do and you do it like you wanted to do it. Wow. That's, submission. That's submission. My pastor told me after I preached my first sermon, I kid you not, I was 19 years old. They were standing up clapping. He's like, don't clap. He ain't an actor. He's like, we're not going to spoil him on amens and praise the Lord and shouts. No, we're going to teach him the ministry of preaching. And he told me, he said, you can't preach outside of this church for a year. Now, keep in mind, I'm the young. Detroit's got all these young, dynamic preachers preaching. And I looked at him and I said, yes, sir. Wow. Because there was nothing else to say. After three months, he came. He uh, said to all of the auxiliary leaders, have this young man do your anniversaries. Because I was faithful. Here's the third thing. You got to have a big picture. Now, that picture, that big picture looks like this. On my best day. And my worst day, this person is in all of my frames. On my best day and my worst day. When I am getting everything I've ever dreamed of, this person is standing with me. When I get the worst news I've ever had, this person is standing with me. If you can't say that, this is not the person for you. Because so often we have said we were in love, but we saw ourselves by ourselves. And that means we ain't in love. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's how you see it. You don't, want to, you don't want to be walking down the aisle with somebody that you can't see in your future, that you can't see in your frames, that you can't see in your life, in your struggles and in your successes. That's why in the marriage vows, we say for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health. If they're not in every frame, there's some, there's some people now who have had to take care of their spouses for years and they ain't old people either. Mm. But the yes, reason they're staying faithful to each other is because they saw each other in their frames. Yes, sir. So, Bishop, what's too young and what's too old? So, you know, it can, is there a consequence for marrying someone that's completely older than you, extremely older, or extremely, you know, younger than you are? Absolutely not. Okay. That's the short answer. Absolutely not. I wish I could tell you that we always know exactly who we're going to love. There's some people that are married and they'll tell you, on the regular dating day, I wouldn't date him. Yes, sir. She said, but I fell in love. I saw this person. I felt this person. I, I became connected to this person and I, I developed a passion for them. I see this person giving me permission and I'm giving them permission and trusting and building that trust, right? You know, I said this some time ago, that if you don't earn my trust, you can't have my truth or transparency. At the end of the day, when you know you're in love, you give your truth and your transparency because they've earned your trust. So wh why are people not getting married today so so quickly? You know, people are, you know, people are waiting, you know, later to marry. Mm -hmm. What do you, what's going on with, with our society that you think is happening? So what's going on with our society is our society is a soundbite culture. So we hear stuff, we don't test stuff, and then we end up believing it, right? Like we've been told, the divorce rate is 50%. Well, it's actually never been 50%. It was always around about 30. Mm. But we keep hearing 50%. 50% of the people getting divorced. 50% of the people getting divorced. Well, it's never been true. And because it's not been true, we've let a misnomer, a, uh, we let, ba let bad information train us. So now half the people who get married get divorced. I ain't getting, you know what I mean? Well, what if half the people who get fired from their job? You gonna stop working? <laughs> Absolutely not. Right. No, we'll take the odds. I burned my hand on the stove, but I still cook. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? I've had an accident in the car, but I still drive. Yes, sir. I've had bad experience on the plane, but I still fly. Mm -hmm. Right. We we've allowed, we've allowed what has been told to us to condition us. Or we've seen bad examples. We've seen bad parents uh, have bad marriages or grandparents or aunts sure. and uncles or friends and instead of us saying you know what i'm going to be the best i could be so what we've done is it's a lack of investigation we've not really mm -hmm. we've not really asked why i don't know why my mama didn't like my daddy well ask find out and maybe you could be the one that says you know what i'm gonna be a better woman 
Mm. Or I'm going to be a better man. Yes, and the truth is, for many, many people, they've not allowed themselves to be loved and to be in love. Mm. Because love and to be in love is vulnerability. I mean, let me just say it plainly. If you open your heart to the joy that love brings, you will open your heart to the sadness love brings. And that's just the way it is. Uh, say that again, Richard. If you open your heart to the joy love brings, you open your heart to the sadness love brings. And that's called life. Wow. Yeah, man. That's called life. Right? You've gone in the gym and you've worked out. You look like you are in tip-top shape. But then the other people who've gone in and done the same thing and had major injuries. Tore a rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. Hurt a knee, etc. Right? You you open the door every day to things that can go wrong. Mm. We don't run or shy away because things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. I've had my heart broken twice, but I'm not I'm not run I'm not shying away from it. I'm not I'm not here to say oh, I hate being married. Don't get married. No, I love marriage. I think marriage is a great. It's God idea, and I think that every person that could ever be married should do it. I think they should do it because you don't know what it's like to come home to somebody who's waited all day to see you and want to be in your space and want to do everything they can to please you and satisfy you and help you and support you and be your cheerleader. You walk through the door and they got a I love game uh, jersey on. Man, um, you get me the jersey. I but just look. This <laughs> I did, I, all right, now. <laughs> Yeah, you've not you've not seen ecstasy. You've not experienced it until you had somebody who's all in for you. You've not experienced it. So is relationship. So when we talk about relationship, do I when I get married, is it about me getting my needs met, or is it about me meeting the needs of others? Ooh, really good question. So it's about dynamic mutuality. Hmm. Dynamic mutuality. It's about you meeting their needs and them meeting your needs. And I start by telling, especially young couples, I was sharing it with two young couples this weekend, that you have to have boundaries and expectations. Expectations come from what you really, really want or you really, really don't want. And you should articulate those expectations. Maybe uh, maybe you say, these are the 10 things or five things that I need. You articulate them to that person that you're in love with, your spouse. If that person works to do those 10 things, what's going to happen? Quite naturally, you're going to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Well, that's simple. Expectations will either rule, R-U-L-E, the relationship, or ruin, R-U-I-N, the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the cookie crumble. If you make those expectations known and those people do everything they can to live those expectations, you're going to be happy. And that's the story. When you say, I want to be happy, start by saying, what are your expectations? Because you can never expect something that you don't deliver in the first place. Yes, sir. If you say, I expect this from someone, you need to be delivering that and showing them the way. Bishop, so let's, let's, let's like get deeper. Do it. Have you been divorced before? Twice. Twice. Mm -hmm. Now you are a Christian. Mm-hmm. And a bishop, mm -hmm. a pastor. Mm -hmm. But how are you divorced twice? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. So often people think when they read scripture that Jesus is saying, if you divorce and once you divorce, you can't ever marry again. If you do, you commit adultery. Or you, you, the person you marry commits adultery and whoever marries your wife commits adultery. We have to remember that Jesus uses a literary term called hyperbole. Yes, sir. Hyperbole. So it's both in, it's uh, both, it's Greek in its etymology and in Latin. So uh, it's hyper to go beyond and bole to cast yes, so essentially hyperbole means to exaggerate something way beyond to focus on the truth yes sir. and when we focus on the truth we notice that jesus uses hyperbole this um literary tool to make sure we explain truth whenever some people hear me say that they're like, oh no that ain't that ain't what i mean that ain't what well jesus said if your right eye offends you pluck it out well well do you do you just pluck your, um, is this self-mutilation Jesus is talking right. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. Cut it off. No, it's hyperbole, yeah. right? If you do, if, if a man divorces a, a woman and another man marries her, you can't commit adultery because marriage is legal. That yes, prevents sir. you commit adultery, yes, right? So what Jesus is doing is he's, he's saying don't frivolously or foolishly uh, or negligently divorce. Abandonment is a, 
Paul says abandonment. abandonment. He tells the Corinthian church abandonment, yes, adultery. adultery. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, there's also abuse, abuse yes, and sir. neglect. Yes, sir. And to be miserable. Oh. Right. Remember what Paul says. Paul says every man ought to love his wife like he loves his own flesh. Yes, no man hates his flesh, but he nourishes it and takes care of it. Right. So what Paul is saying is if there is no way that you can see that this person is giving themselves for you, then you got to ask yourself some significant questions. Did God design you to be miserable? And of course, the same thing that happened in Moses' day when he gives the writ of divorcement is the same thing happened today. People use divorce as a get out of jail free card. Mm. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is chipping at that. He's like, no, no, no. Don't just divorce because you, you mad. Or don't just divorce because you fell out of love. Find that love again. Yes. Don't divorce. So the emphasis is on not divorcing. So in my case, my goal was not to get divorced. When I got married, I intended on being married. Even though when I got married the first time, me and my wife were in love, she got pregnant. So we got married because she got pregnant. Uh -huh. And that love never grew. That, no, that love never grew to where it was so deeply passionate. But we had responsibilities, we had bills, and we had decided we were going to get together until one day she asked for a divorce. When she asked for a divorce, I waited a year before I responded. Wow. I didn't respond. I got to win watch football. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I do not want to. Right. Listen, yeah. I'm young and I'm a pastor. No, I ain't trying to deal with this. Yeah. So we. So the day came where she said, no, I'm serious. And she didn't say it in, in a malicious way. She is a good woman. She is remarried. I am happy for her. I am proud of her. Mm -hmm. If she were to pick up the phone and call me today and say, hey, I need information, I'd give it to her without reservation. Yeah. And I got married the second time and I was deeply in love. But she asked for a divorce after about six years. Well, it took us almost nine years to settle it, right? I refuse to let my life be marred by a person who no longer wants to be married. And so I have nothing I have nothing to say on her behalf, everything to say on my behalf. Mm -hmm. I've learned some valuable lessons. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could be a better husband. I could be more committed to the expectations. I could be more understanding. I could be more forgiving. I could be more open. Mm -hmm. I could work harder for reconciliation. I, you know, I, and I hate to use this, but because we're kind of being raw, mm -hmm. you can get the manure back in the horse once it gets out. Yeah, it, right. it is just what it is. Yeah. However, I'm a firm believer that marriage is God's idea. I'm a firm believer that we ought to work to do everything we can to keep marriage permanent and keep the covenant of marriage. But I'm also a firm believer that God is not upset with you because you end up being divorced. So, so I, okay. So as a pastor, mm -hmm. as a person, mm -hmm. I am not disqualified from ministry and I'm not disqualified from life. Am I a failure? If I get a divorce, you deny Jesus. Did you get disqualified from serving? You denied him. Mm. On the day of Pentecost, you preach between three and seven minutes and 3,000 souls get saved. No, you did not. You doubted him. Did you get disqualified? You, you did. You, you betrayed him with a kiss. Yeah. No. God is into love. God is into restoration. God is into using you. God is not going to disqualify. Man disqualifies people. Yes. God does not. No, God does not. He so are we really concerned about how God views us or is it about how people view us? How people view. So how do I do? There's some major denominations in our country. If yes, you divorce, sir. they call it a moral failure mm -hmm. and you're disqualified from ministry. Mm -hmm. We had a major pastor in Atlanta to get divorced. And his denomination, if you get divorced, is considered a moral failure and you have to be removed from your church. He was so popular, a Caucasian. Mm -hmm. He was so popular. His television broadcast was so popular. His church was so popular that they said, well, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But you got to go back and apologize to all these people. If they had to quit, you got to quit. Yes, he sir. didn't. About 20 years later, he retired peacefully. Mm. We got to stop moving the goalposts. We got to stop having double standards. Yes, sir. That's just it. So how do I, so in the church, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, uh, I'm a pastor uh, or I'm a minister. I'm an elder. I'm a deacon. Mm -hmm. um, I have some type of influential position in mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. Do I need to stay married because I'm afraid of what people are going to say? And, and, and then the second thing to that is how do I transition out of a marriage if I fit those two, those three or four descriptions, abuse, 
I'm just miserable. There's been uh, some type of adultery. What's the transition there? So, so let me start by saying, after you've done everything you could do, okay, if it's going to create some kind of tension that would lead to some kind of violence or some kind of behavior that diminishes your witness, you need to find a way to get out. You need to find a way to get out. I, I don't advocate for divorce. I do not advocate for divorce but i also don't advocate for needless suffering mm. i also don't advocate for a foolish perspective that hinges on i don't want people to look down on me but yet i'm miserable and i'm finding it emotionally and mentally draining to keep up the image that's what we do we have put ourselves in debt in order to keep up an image we, we have clothes and shoes that we can't afford to keep up an image. No, the day for playing games and hiding behind the mask is over. People can be free enough to say, we've done everything we could. We've gone to counseling. We've sat with our pastor. We've prayed together. We've worked through. We've done everything we could, and we can't seem to fix this. If God doesn't give you a miracle and you stay in that marriage, you're going to be miserable. And it's misery that God hates. So how long should I... Pray, and when I say this, I mean, let's say uh, I'm. I, I want her to to change her mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm praying and believing God, and I'm holding on to faith. Mm -hmm. When is when is the right time to say it's time to let go? be discerning? Be discerning. I think that all of us should tune into the frequency of God, so that we know what God is asking and expecting of us in our relationship. Our problem sometimes is that we pray, but we ignore God. What is God saying in this? If God says to you, hang on, then hang on. But how do I know it's God, Lord Bishop? Because my emotions are driving me. Go back to the word. Uh, God confirms God's word through his word. God, can, God confirms God's choices through his word. Go back and look at the model in scripture and see, hear God's voice through scripture. See what he has done from antiquity to modernity. And then get wise counsel. Put people, men and women who love God and who have given themselves, put them also in your ear. You don't have to tell everybody your business. Certainly don't get up in front of the church and say it, but sit with your pastor, sit with the elders, sit with the intercessors and say, I want to do the right thing by God. Here's what I've learned about God. Then when I strain to find his will, I don't strain long. Remember what Jesus says, ask and it shall be given. Yes, Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. I hold God to that. Yes, sir. You know what God is holding me to do? Ask, seek, and knock. Mm. You, want to, you want to answer, but you ain't asked a question yet. Ask. Mm. You want to see something, but you've not saw it. You want a door to open that you've not knocked on. Absolutely not. God has an expectation. God has principles. God has rules. God has rules, and we have to abide by them. Yes, sir. Yeah, we have to abide by them. Uh, so... So what what happens is people say, um, you gotta fight for your marriage. Mm -hmm. How do I know when to fight for the marriage that I'm I'm losing? Mm -hmm. And how do I know when to say, okay, it's over? So I think that whole fight thing goes back to the whole honor thing. I am going to honor my marriage irrespective of if the other person honors it. I'm going to do right irrespective if they do it or not. I am going to be upstanding. I'm going to go above and beyond ir irrespective if they do it. Here's our problem. We are always people who are big on reciprocity. If you do it, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. I play off you. So if you do it, Gabe, I'm going to do it. And if you don't do it, I'm not going to do it. That's not maturation. That's immaturity. Mm -hmm. No. You do the right thing because it's right. And if you do the right thing because it's right, the one thing you'll be able to hold your head high and say, I stayed and do it until the very end. I did what was right. Yeah. I showed up. I was faithful. I was committed. I was passionate. I was loving. I was there. Right? For many of us, in difficult times, we have to have a high-level strategy. And what we do in difficult times is we go back to acting like we from the ghetto. Like we alley, right? If we're playing for a championship game, you can't play street ball. 
You got to play with that high level strategy. You got to listen to your coaches. Mm -hmm. You got to listen to the play callers. Mm -hmm. You got to watch your defense. You got to do everything you can to make sure that you're staying in the zone. And for many Christians, we don't stay in the zone. We get our feelings hurt. We get out the zone. Mm -hmm. How many people have done? How many people have you seen got their feelings hurt and left the church? Left encounter, yes, got, uh, left gathering, yes, got my feelings hurt. No, no, no. When you're in the zone, you stay there and you take the bumps and the bruises. And in marriage, there'll be times where you have to do more taking. You have to take more. You have to accept more. You have to give more, mm -hmm. right? But those are the moments that define great marriages. The moments that define the best marriages are not the easy moments. Those are the moments we enjoy. Yes, sir. The moments that define us is how we work through our difficulty. That's that's the, God, I, I hate to use it again, but that's the real story. Yes, sir. We, we are defined and deepened by the difficulties that we can survive. Yes, sir. So if one person says, I don't want to be married, and the other person says, but I'm going to fight for my marriage, mm -hmm. when should that person say, okay, the fight is over because this person it, obviously, you don't want to be when married. that person walks out, moves out, sends the divorce papers and shows up in court and the judge say you're divorced, then stop fighting mm. until that. Keep fighting. Keep fighting, bro. We've seen miracles happen at the last minute. We, I'm serious. I'm serious. I know of a story of a man who leaned over to his wife in divorce court on the final day where the judgment was getting ready to be issued and said, I don't want this. I want you. I'll do whatever it takes. She said, whatever it takes. He said, whatever. She stood up and said, you're on, I'll take him back. And they walked out. Wow. And they lived together until he passed away. Wow. Just, you have to go all the way to the very end. What if Jesus would have survived Gethsemane, survived mar being marched from courtroom to courtroom, survived the beating, but got to the cross and said, I'm tired of this. I'm done. See y'all. I ain't doing this. What would have happened? Mm. Yeah, no. In order to get salvation, he had to go all the way. And in order to say to God, I've done what you asked me to do, you got to go all the way. You wow. have to go all the way. Should a, should a pastor, let's use pastoring as an example. Mm -hmm. You've been married, you've been divorced twice. Mm -hmm. How have you pastored and how have you been divorced twice and still pastored? Have you been... Mm -hmm ostracized that people talked about you mm -hmm. how have you done it yeah so i still maintained the truth what's the truth i believe in marriage i believe in the biblical model of marriage and i believe that god honors marriage and i believe you ought to do everything you can see i never changed the truth just because i had two failed marriages mm. yeah we don't do that you we have a world right now and you know this probably uh, better than me we got a world right now when they don't want something, they make the Bible ineffective in that area. Yes, sir. So, so you don't want to change your lifestyle. So that's wrong in the Bible. Yeah. Nah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And I told, and I told them I was, I was transparent. But the thing that I think that pastors have to get, since you use pastors yes, specifically, we cannot turn the pulpit into a place for tabloid Christianity. You got to preach the truth, even the part that you don't live. Ah. Uh. So you got to preach the truth. Is that a hypocrite, Bishop? No, a hypocrite is a person that doesn't try. Uh, yes, if you're trying and you keep failing, that means you're trying. You're not a hypocrite. Yes, sir. See, I believe a truth, even the truth that I struggle to live. Yes, sir. I believe that truth. Right? I believe that truth. Right? I used to play baseball. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I used to play baseball. And I could throw a pretty mean fastball. But every so often, people hit and hit a home run. Every so often, I couldn't strike a person out. Right? I still practice baseball even when I failed. Gotcha. I still practice the faith even when I fail miserably. A hypocrite is someone who does not try. They don't even attempt. They say it, but they don't do it. They don't do it. They say it, but they have no real meaning or intention about living it. That's a hypocrite. If you say something in your pulpit that's a solid truth, but you fail at it, no, you're not a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. We have all been, we have all gone in through, gone through temptations and trials and tribulations where we have worked so hard to say something and live it. And the truth is we fail. Wow. Yeah. It happens to all of us in everything, in everything. Bishop, will ever, will, will everyone get married? Will every pastor, because I think we put this pressure on pastors to be married 
And then we put these pressures on pastors to stay married and pastors stay married in, mar in miserable relationships because of the image. Will every person be married? No, I, I don't think every person will be married. I don't even think every person should be married. Uh, talk there, about it. There's some people who are just never going to be the kind of people that can be open enough, expressive enough, loving enough, committed enough, invested enough to be married. And they shouldn't get married because nobody should have to suffer from your lack of expression. Yeah, why, why should someone have to suffer, right? And that doesn't mean that you're going to be sinful. It, it may mean you just decide, I'm going to be over here and I'm going to do me. Yes, sir. What do you do if you want to be married and you want to do all of those things you just said, but nobody's asking, nothing is working out. What do you do? And, and, and does, that have something, does it have something to do with, is something wrong with you? No. What do you do while you're, while you're wanting those things to happen? Yeah, I think that we have to put ourselves in preferred positions. You know, uh, if you want a better job, what do you have to do? Update your resume. Mm. You have to go on interviews, right? Some years ago, they, uh, um, I think Robert Allen was um, teaching a course on buying real estate. And he gave an axiom that just really moved the needle of my thinking. He said, see a lot of houses, make a lot of offers. And I have applied that formula to life. See a lot of houses, make a lot of offers. See a lot of opportunities make a lot of offers. There'll be some, what we've done is we've created these boundaries that don't need to be created. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on my Boaz. You've missed the boat. You better come to 2020. You're in the driver's seat. Yeah. You're 2021. You're in the driver's seat. You ain't waiting on Boaz. If there's somebody you want, go after them. Take your shot. Uh, the Bible say, a man find a wife, find a good thing, obtain a favor from the Lord. Understand the context. Understand you ain't in ancient Israel. Mm. You are in modern America. Yes, sir. So what, what does it take? If you if you have to go on a dating site, go on a dating site. If you have to be the one to initiate the conversation, initiate the conversation. Uh, I heard a lady say, I ain't calling no man. If he want to talk to me, he'll call me. And I said, that's why you're still single. Well, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. If you're interested, be interested. Right? I'm interested in making money. So you know what I'm going to do? I am not going to sit at home on my hands. I'm going to be out there. I was talking to a guy putting in cabinets. I said, how do we franchise this business? He said, glad you asked. I've been thinking about that. What would have happened had I never asked? Yes, sir. I told him I, I'd like to learn. He's like, but you're a pastor. I was like, man, please. I work. Wow. I work for a living. Here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach the people at Gathering of Champions. I'm going to teach the people that I know. I'm going to teach my friends. Yeah. I'm going to come and tell Gabe, Gabe, last year I made $400,000 on cabinets. Guess what Gabe going to be doing? Cabinet. cabinet. Like, me, me in the county line, we're going to find us some cabinet hookups. Yes, right? Sir. I'm never going to keep something from me because it's not necessarily what um, is looked upon as uh, parallel yeah. or connected to my vocation. I was putting up some sheetrock and me and my son was bringing it in. He was like, oh, I'm dad, who's going to help us with it? I said, me and you? He was like, dad, you can put up sheetrock? I said, son, you think all I can do is preach. Well, that's all I see. I said, well, that's what you see me do, son. I said, I can put up this sheetrock on my own. Wow. I can put it up, tape it, mud it, sand it, and paint it, and we good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I want to go back to something that you asked. Do we have any questions? Uh, all right. Hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's do this. I want to ask this. So you, you, is it okay for a woman to go after a man that she wants? Absolutely. I don't think women should be hindered in any way. I don't think she needs to be a slave to conventional thinking about relationship, especially this uh, this misunderstanding of the Christian uh, faith. The man got to find you. Now, please find him, right? Find find somebody that's compatible. Talk to him. See where he's at. Get mm. to know him. You might discover this. I don't want him. Mm. He look good, but I don't want him. So what, what's a what's what's an appropriate way for a woman to go after a man directly, just like a man? Directly, absolutely. Don't play no games. Really, be strong. Be strong. There's a passage um, in Proverbs 31 that I love to read about that virtuous woman. It says she makes herself strong. Every time I hear that, I'm like, yes, <laughs> yeah. sister. Yeah, go after it. Absolutely. Don't be limited by anything. I mean, don't be limited. If if you see somebody you like, you interested in somebody, go after them. So it's okay for a woman to say. Hey, I'm interested in you. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to take you out. Really? Yes, I think it's okay. 
just as much as I think it's okay for a guy to say it. And be okay with rejection. Be okay with somebody saying no. Is it okay? What, what's your opinion on uh, what, what's your opinion on online dating? Yeah, whatever. Go for it. Absolutely. There are so many wonderful ways in which to connect with people so that you can see if there's an interest or there's a connection. I'd say do it. Try it. If it's not your thing, don't do it. Got you. But if it is your thing, do it. Online dating is not my thing. Mine either. Nope. I'm just, I'm not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be connected to anybody who sees me as Bishop. I need them to see me as Brian. Wow. I'm a regular guy. Yeah. Bishop is my title. It's what I do. Right. It's what I serve the Lord. But I do need you to know when I go home after church, I'm not Bishop. Yes, I'm sir. Brian. Yes, sir. Right? I, I don't want to come home and be like, oh, man of God. No, no. <laughs> Baby. Yeah. What we about to do? You're right. <laughs> we about to eat and get this nap. Right. <laughs> Right, because brother wow. worked hard any time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so before we ask some que- answer some questions, my my question is, how do I get out of a bad marriage? How, what's the process? Good conversations, and I'm gonna uh, use a term and you've heard me use it before. Mm-hmm. Kneecap to kneecap, yes, to sit in front of a person yes, and say, "I want to know what your estimation of this marriage is." All right, mm-hmm. what is it? And then I want them to give me an opportunity to say. And then I want to be able to articulate what's going on, mm-hmm. what's going wrong, what it is, right? Start by having conversations. Here's the thing that we we should never do, because I believe it'll dishonor God. We should never split up and the person is confused as to why. It should be clear. We should be lucid. We should be contemplative. We should be thoughtful. We should be succinct. And we should tell them the truth. Minute, yep. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to do a shouting. By the time we're about to break up, all the argument is done. We need to tell them the truth. And we need to say to them, if these things could change, we could make it work. But if they can't, I'm not going to subjugate myself to that. What if we're in the same church? Mm -hmm. In the same church Mm -hmm. and it's not a mega church. It's not 10, 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. A few hundred people, maybe 50 people, 70 Mm -hmm. people, whatever. Um, how do I walk away and how, what's, what, what's, what's the way to, to get a divorce and still be in the same, uh, assembly or is that even possible? It is very possible. Okay. It's very possible with very mature people. Gotcha. Um, we don't want to diminish the witness of the church under any circumstance. And I know there are people who say, well, well he really just want to hide. No, I don't want to hide. We just don't want to diminish the witness of the church. Sure. The goal of the church is for people to come here and hear the word of God mm-hmm. and be engaged in fellowship with people who are going to encourage them to live a Christian life, to have a renewed interest in the faith and to live it in a powerful way. If I can't be in the same church with you and that be accomplished, I'll sacrifice my church so that that can be accomplished. Mm-hmm. We sacrifice ourselves for the greater good. Yeah. And if we can't, we're selfish. The moment we become selfish, selfless, and humble is the moment that we can remain in the same church. And then I ain't got to eyeball you. I ain't got to trip. I ain't got to look crazy. If you sitting with somebody, I ain't rolling my eyes. No crazy junk like that. If you can't do that because you're not mature enough, then you need to look at another place for fellowship. Absolutely. And again, start with kneecap to kneecap conversations with your senior leader. We are we are divorced. We've had a bad breakup. What do I need to do? Start there and then go, go knowing what you want to do. I, I want to work here, but I don't know that my work can be effective here. Gotcha. If you're not able to do the, the ministry to what you're called, with your call without being in that same church, then you're going to become a distraction. Yeah. How often have we seen that? Yeah. Like it's one of my pet peeves. I can't stand distractions in church. Yeah. Like it's one of, I, oh, I'm yeah. serious, man. I'm like, sure. who as dark as I am, I turn red. <laughs> She, it, oh, it, look, wow. it takes a lot to make me turn red because yeah. I'm mighty dark. But I'm just saying, no, if you can't be in the same church and be faithful and fruitful, then you need to go to another church. Gotcha. This is my church. I was here before him. I, no, no, no. If you're going to clown, you're not going to represent the fruit of the spirit. You need to find another church oh, wow. because your witness is diminished. And now you're causing people to have faith crisis mm. because they see you as a leader. And now you acting like a loser. So last question, we're going to take some questions. Mm-hmm. What are the grounds for divorce? What are the 
when is it okay? What are some of those practical situations where you say you can you can you can get that divorce? Mm -hmm. So let's go. Let's start with the Bible. Okay. Jesus says adultery. Mm -hmm. um, Paul says abandonment by an unbeliever. Right. Mm -hmm. We see images in scripture that teach us how to function and dwell together. If there is abuse, you have to survive. God did not call you to give your life to an abuser. And that is physical abuse, okay. emotional abuse, mm -hmm. intellectual abuse. Mm. You are not bound to stay when it's killing you to stay. You're not. For people to say, well, that ain't what the Bible says. Well, just read the Bible in its entirety. Yes, sir. That we are to, a man is supposed to love his wife. If he beats on his wife, he does not love her. She can be unhinged from him. If a man refuses to support his wife, and, and that goes both ways. Absolutely. So I'm saying man, but if right, man or right, woman, right. Yes, sir. right? You can be unhinged from that, right? You can do everything you can to work it out. You can go to counseling. You can sit with your pastor. You can read books. Y'all can try things. See if you can work through it. But the last thing, that God would be pleased with is you to stay in a marriage that's going to cause you your life. There are some people who have gone crazy. They have had mental breakdowns. You're staying in a marriage and you've had three breakdowns? Nah. That's not healthy. And God doesn't have to tell you to get out. Self-preservation says that. Mm -hmm. On Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the very base is subsistence. You got to feel protected and you got to survive. Yeah. If a, if a pastor tells you, and I've seen a number of people and I'm not going to call his name out loud, but he always go, am I right? <laughs> well, well, let me just tell him. If you say that a woman who is being abused by her husband has got to stay, you are absolutely wrong, sir. Yes, sir. Period. Yes, sir. And I will argue that with you on your television program, in the streets, in the airport, wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. I would argue because I'm not afraid. Yeah. These are opinions that I've developed through careful study of scripture and making sure that I'm planted in. I'm not telling people to go get divorced. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not telling them to stay in marriages that's killing them. Yeah. Killing them. You've been robbed of peace. You have no joy. And there's nothing that you guys are doing to work toward it. And you are sinking. How can you serve God like that? How can people see your good works and glorify the Father who is above? If if that is if that is taking place, you are miserable. No. Mm -mm. Yeah, I think you have to put. I think you have to put righteous thinking in all your processing. But I also think you need to put right thinking, wisdom, in your process. Right? You working hard, and all the money is blown. And all the bills are behind. I've known of a couple, she blew all the money and they lost their house. Lost their cars. You got baby babies. You ain't got to be mad with me. I want to feel pretty. You, more, you, you mortgage the family to feel pretty? This is live. I'll tell you what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, give me some questions. Give me some questions. What are, what are, what are, what are they asking? So, the first question has to do with the marriage that is not healthy. Mm -hmm. Marriage fights for each other, not just for Okay. Can they hear you? You're not. Oh, so I got to repeat the question. All right, go ahead. So, what are the steps of reconciliation in that regard? What are the steps of rec reconciliation mm -hmm. in that regard? Ooh, really good question. Really, I don't know who asked them, but tell them a really good question. Really good question, yo. It starts with forgiveness. Mm. Reconciliation will never take place in a crucible of unforgiveness. If you want reconciliation, you've got to suck it up and forgive. You've got to forgive even if you do not feel like they have apologized to the degree for which they've caused insult and injury got to forgive if forgiveness isn't primary sustainability won't exist you got to forgive 
you got to forgive. And sometimes you got to take more of the offense and ask the Lord to help you heal. Got to start with forgiveness. Start with forgiveness. The second thing is reestablishing expectations. We've forgiven you, but here are the expectations. Here are the boundaries, Mm. right? Third thing, seek intervention. I believe that all knowledge is God's knowledge. And I believe that we need therapists. We need counselors. We need psychologists. We need psychiatrists. We need good old-fashioned African-American proverbial wit and wisdom. Mm. We need it. So we put ourselves in spaces. Another piece to reconciliation is getting a good model. Couples need couples. Yeah. Couples need couples that have survived storms, right? And then I think we need incremental periods of check-in. Let's make sure we're on the right track. Let's make sure that we're going down the right track. Some years ago, I was reading a book and uh, the guys at the bottom of the ladder was shouting to the guys at the top of the ladder. And the uh, guys at the bottom of the ladder was like, hey, guy at the top of the ladder said, what? He said, the ladder is on the wrong building. The guy at the top said, who cares? We're making progress. (laughs) So we got to make sure that the ladder is on the right building. Mm. And sometimes you'll need to have the right kinds of people in your life to make sure the ladder Mm. is on the right building. Now, let me give you a caution. Activity doesn't mean progress. Mm. So just because we go on a cruise and just because we hang out and just because we go to the mall and just because you buy gifts don't mean real forgiveness is taking place. How do we know real forgiveness is taking place? Change. Change. That's it. How do we know real forgiveness is taking place? Change happens. When you're authentically sorry and you've been forgiven by someone, you work hard not to blow their forgiveness. Change. 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 Give me another question. Yeah. as cordial as possible for the sake of the children. All right, so let me ask the question. So say it again. If you've gotten a divorce divorce and you have children, how should the relationship be? As cordial and as professional as possible because we want the children, especially in Christian homes, to see healthy continuance even if the marriage cannot be sustained. The women see healthy continuance, right? My kids said, we didn't hear y'all fuss. Well, that was one of our expectations. You ain't going to see us loud. You know, my children rarely heard me yell and scream outside of church mm-hmm. because we wanted to make sure they saw it. I didn't want my kids to point and say, the guy in the pulpit up there preaching, he ain't the guy at home. Mm-hmm. I was afraid of that. So I had to, I had to choke back. I had to create new levels of discipline and boundaries mm-hmm. to make sure that I did not deceive my children. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't just me and their mother not being together. I didn't want them to walk away from the faith. Saying, nah, I don't want this faith. Yeah. They ain't doing nothing for my daddy. Yeah, wow. You know what I mean? So I wanted them to, to do that. So stay cordial and, and to mitigate anything that you would say negative because children are impressionable. Yeah. They'll bounce back from divorce, Mm -hmm. but rarely do they bounce back from negative imagery that arises out of ways in which you think you act and you model. Wow. Give me two more questions, Brian. Um, What would you ask clients to do? Ooh. Mm -hmm. So let me say it in the mic. What should you ask before getting married? So let me, uh, let me answer it in um, the larger way and I'm going to funnel down. Have conversations and pay attention to what's being said. Okay. All right. Have conversations. Don't ever be with that person that you're interested in and not talk to them. Always talk. When you get with, when you get with that person that you're interested in, keep this out of your hands. Ah. Keep your eyes on them. Talk to them. And don't just ask them sugar-coated questions. Yes, sir. Ask them tough questions. Like, just, ask them, what would you do if we're having a bad run? What would you do if I if my attitude changes? What, how, how would you react? 
quote you? Ask them tough questions. Put them in scenarios. Create narrative, right? There are stories that you've seen, stories that you've heard, things that your friends have gone through. Put that question to them. Pose it to them and say, what would you do? How would you react? Be, be wary of people who say, I don't know what I would do. I need you to think. Mm. Marriage is a thinking person's proposition. You got to think. How would you handle this? You could say, hey, my girlfriend spent all her husband's money for the last year. What would you do if I did that to you? I can tell you this, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'd be all, right, you don't know. Yeah. He's like, I'd choke her, I'd choke her. No, nah, you don't want him now. Yeah. He, want, yeah. he got Ike Turner in him, uh-uh. Yeah. No, nah, we don't want him, right? Ask questions, right? That's the bigger way. Mm-hmm. Always have conversations. Keep that phone out of your hand and have faithful conversations. And, and challenge them. Hey, we're going to dinner tonight. Have some questions you want to ask me. Mm-hmm. Have some conversations oh, you wow. want to have. Right. So, so Bishop, you said, you said we're going to dinner tonight. Have some questions you want to ask me. Mm-hmm. I don't think we do that. No, I think, no, I know we don't. No, we don't do that. <laughs> no, we don't do that. that we don't do that. It, 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 wow. So everything shouldn't be about we're just we're just kicking it. Right. Wow. I think we need to get rid of casual conversations as our primary mode of communication, and we need to ask critical questions, especially. Uh, Brittany's question. Brittany, right? Brandy. That's good. Sorry, sorry, Brandy. That's actually her sister that she just called. Brittany. Brit- Brittany's sister. Mm-hmm. So Brandy asked a very pivotal question. I was sitting with a colleague of mine, a female colleague of mine. We were at um, a, a restaurant in Cumberland. She and I have gone back and forth, back and forth. I mean, one could barely finish before the other starts talking. We're sitting next to a couple that's married. They never stopped looking at their phones. They wow. looked up one time to talk to the waitress. Mm. and I brought it to her attention and she says that's really sad isn't it I said you're wasting valuable time this is time that you could make serious inquiry into this person that you're married to to find out where they are it's it's time that you can say to them I want to praise you for what you did this week what I do right I got into my car and the gas was on full thank you it was clean. Thank you. I want to tell you that's so ama- that means so much to me. Or you help with laundry, or you cook, and I want you to know I ain't let that slip. I saw that. That thing moved me. That thing made me happy. I appreciate your help and your support. You know what you're doing? Well, Stephen Covey called this. You're making a deposit in the emotional bank account. But because we don't have enough conversations, we don't get to make enough deposits. Because we don't talk to each other. And then you can move right on to the corrective and say, hey, here are two things that I really like and you missed an opportunity this week. Let me tell you what could have happened. You know the first thing they're going to do? They're going to take in all that praise and they're not going to fire back at you. They're not going to rebuff you because you started by giving them praise. Right? as As a teacher, whenever a student turns in work, the first thing I say is, thank you for sharing. I appreciate your work. Every time. Even if, it, if it's trash work. Well, if it's trash work, I'm going to get to it. Right. But I honestly do appreciate them for doing it. Yeah. I appreciate them for doing the work, giving me something to grade. And then I'll say, here's what you need to focus yeah. on. Yeah. Your paragraphing was off. Uh, you need one inch margins around there. So here's what you said in your opening sentence, but you never came back to that. Right. So I'm gonna, I want to make sure that I let them know how what they're doing. And the moment I let them know what they're doing, they now have the necessary information to make change. See, what we've done is we've been mad at people and didn't tell them how to get it right. How you going to want to cuss me out and you can't tell me how to get it right? Well, how do I get it right? I don't know. You don't know. No, I don't. As a matter of fact, I don't. Tell me how to get it right. Tell me how to get it right. I hurt you. Yes, you did. How do I get it right? Yeah. I want to make you happy. You don't know how to make me happy? You act like you ain't been with a woman before. The truth is, all women are different. Yeah. I had a guy one time. His wife said, I want to learn, I want us to do different things intimately. He was like, Well, my last girlfriend liked that. I asked her, I said, Stand up, stand up. She stood up. I said, Go out. I said, What's wrong with you? I said, Don't you ever say nothing like that again. Yeah. Don't you ever tell your wife your last girlfriend like what you do? Well, what should I do? Honor her. Tell her to teach you. I'm a real man. Obviously, you're a real man. Yeah. But you're more than breath and britches. I need you. I need you to be responsive to her. If she says there's something she don't like, 
Say, what can I do to make you happy? Right? A colleague of mine said, Hodges, what a great sermon you preach. I said, what can I do to be better? Yeah. I do it routinely. Because the truth is I want to get better. I've been preaching for 30 years, but I want to get better. I want to be better. Right? So start by being willing to say to someone and share with them the truth and then show them how to get it right. Why do we penalize people and don't help them get it right? I taught my kids to go to the potty. I taught my kids how to walk, right? And when they got it wrong, I helped them get it right. And sometimes it was sitting my son on the toilet. Mm, 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 mm. Right? I had to clean my son. He didn't have the competency to do it. We think just because you're a man or just because you're a woman, you got everything you need to be good. No, we're learning. We're learning. Yes. We're learning. We're learning. <sighs> Brian, give me one more question. After you get the divorce, what personal steps should you take? What should you be focused on? Wait, 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 wait. I called her Brittany. Mm -hmm. You said her sister's name. Yeah. So it's overachievers in the whole family. Sure. I got it. Okay. Just, yeah, I just yeah, want to yeah. make sure I said yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Everybody in the family overachiever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this, this is a family of exceptional people. Yeah, All absolutely. of our cousins are every average. Last, but last, right. last right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please tell Britt I said what's up. Um, after you get a divorce, a couple of things. One, get a support group. Okay. I said to my pastor and mentor, I said, I want you to ask me the hard questions and look at me, look in my eyes. The first thing he said is, are you okay? Mm -hmm. I said, yes. He looked right in my eyes. He said, I believe you. Right? So I got a support group. Second thing, get a counselor. Get a therapist. Even if you feel like you're fine? You are not fine. You're not fine. Nope. You are not fine. Mm -hmm. So if you get a divorce... First thing you need to do is get a, find a support group, then get a counselor, even mm -hmm. if you feel okay. You know the silent killer? What is it? Blood pressure. You feel fine. There are people who have heart attacks. They feel fine. A friend of mine, they took his blood sugar. It was at 600. He said, well, I feel fine. Just because you feel fine don't mean you are fine. You need someone to sit you down and talk you through what's happening to you, what's happened to you. You need them to ask you the hard questions. You need time for reflection and contemplation. You need time to be able to say, you know what? Something major just occurred. And not to sit down and say, yeah, I want you to talk to me about them. Talk to me about me. I told a friend of mine, talk to me about Hodge. And it was tough because he wasn't asking no nice questions. And I had to admit, our humanity should lead to humility. It should not lead to arrogance. You're not okay. And you should be at a place where you can reasonably and rationally accept help. I want help. I want help. Right? Let me give you a third thing. Give yourself space to heal. Yeah. Right? After the divorce, give yourself space to heal. Is it okay to go out on a dinner, a date with people? Yeah, but let them know. Say, I'm just not ready for a committed relationship. Yeah, I ain't ready for nothing else. Yeah, we can go out and have dinner because I want to sit. I don't like eating by myself. Yeah, so I don't mind sitting at a table with someone and l let's chop it up and let's talk about what's happening in the world because certainly there's enough happening in the world for us to talk about. Yeah. But if you're not ready for a committed relationship, don't do it. Don't do it because all you're going to do is create pain for others. Because just, I've seen cars that had no dents, no dings, that were shiny and wouldn't start. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Wow. That it looked good on the outside, yeah. but it don't function. Yeah. I mean, I, I told this story some years ago. When I drank soda, I used to get, uh, Walmart had a, a soda, uh, a, a Sierra. It's like Sierra Mist, but it wasn't. Okay. It was 25 cents. And I put it in the machine and I got nothing. Put put in the machine, push the button, nothing. Put another, I don't know why I did it. I put another quarter in. Yeah. Pushed it. 
Nothing. I wanted that soda bad, didn't I? Yeah. Put a third quarter in. Wow. Nothing. I backed up a little bit and I saw a piece of paper hanging right out of the bottom. It had fallen off the machine. It said out of order. <laughs> wow. Now, let me tell you the new definition I got from out of order. Out of order means no matter how much you put in it, it ain't going to work. When you refuse to get yourself a checkup from the neck up, no matter what they put in you, you'll never work. Never work. Bishop, where where can we follow you and find you? Yeah, yeah. so on it's Instagram, uh, Instagram Dr. Brian Keith Hodges on Instagram, uh, Brian Keith Hodges on Twitter, Bishop Hodges on Facebook. Bitch, you gotta do more on Instagram. You don't post it on Instagram. So listen, you you're leading me. You gotta do more. Whatever you teach me, I'm doing. You got you gotta do like all of this, you gotta be on Instagram. Consider it done. Right. I, I need you and I need Brandy. Y'all give me the lessons and work. Shout out to uh several of the people that gather in the champions who told me exactly what you just said. Yes, and of course, you know I have a number of wonderful people like Brandon and Erica yes, McCray sir. and Felicia yes, Grayer sir. and others who are always pushing me. So I'm just going to have to stop pushing back and do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. <laughs> Bishop, you, um, you have a book as well, right? Uh, it's called Basic Money Matters. And um, it's the, you, I think you can get it off, you can still get it off Amazon. Amazon. And I still have a few, uh, a few copies. Bishop, could you, could you say, uh -huh. If someone is saying, "Hey, I'm I'm going through this this exact circumstance," just just say something to us before we go. Mm -hmm. Let me say three things to you. Don't isolate yourself. You're you're not the only one that's going through it. You're not the only one that's had disappointment or heartbreak or frustration. You're not the only one that's felt abandoned. Or you're not the only one that's felt like you're in it by yourself. Yeah. Don't don't break. Don't break. Yeah. I think the second thing I would say is. Get intervention. You don't have to carry this by yourself. A Cyrenian helped Jesus yes, sir. carry that cross. A yes, black man, a black man, Simon, yes, sir. helped him carry that cross. The man who was getting ready to save the world had help yes, carrying that cross up the Via Della Rosa. Yes, sir. I think the third thing is don't let it get bad before you get involved in self-preservation. Start immediately. Start immediately. The Bible says that Jesus, uh, Peter asked Jesus if, if that was him, could he walk on water with him? And Jesus said, come. And he, saw, he felt the wind and he saw the waves. He took his eyes off Jesus. And the Bible says, beginning to sink. Yeah. He said, Lord, save me. Yeah. Not sunk. Yeah, that's right. He didn't drown. <laughs> on his way, he said, Lord save me. Yeah. There's some people you wait until you under the water. Peter had a sense. I like Peter. Yeah. Peter had a sense about himself. I ain't waiting until I get over my head. I'm saying, Lord save me. Yeah. The last thing I would say is spiritual disciplines. Mm -hmm. Go back to what works. Stay in the word. Stay in worship. Mm -hmm. Stay in. Listen to the sermons. Uh, pray. Find yourself some space to pull back and be in solitude. Don't isolate yourself. Yeah. Don't, don't stop answering people's phone calls. Don't right? You can tell people what's going on with you in your marriage. Say that's intensely private, and I would care and prefer not to share it. Yeah, that's it. But you don't stop being a friend. All people want to do is get in your business. People care. If I see you, I was I was driving down the street and I was worshiping in my car, and tears were rolling down my face. I was worshiping and singing and had my hands lifted. And the lady pulls up next to me. And she's blowing her horn. And I hear her, but I just kind of keep going. Get to the next light. She rolls down her window. She gets close enough to wave her hand. I roll my window down. She said, are you okay? I said, I am. I'm just worshiping. She said, you are okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't isolate yourself. Let people care. Right? If, if there's something you don't want to talk about, Say I don't want to talk about it, right? I don't. I don't want to talk about it. I, I, and I don't mind saying I don't want to talk about it. I also don't mind saying I don't want to talk about it with you. And that's not being rude. Yeah, it's just telling you I want to talk about that with, with you. I never put my personal life in the pulpit. I never put my personal life in the church. I don't because I want God to be glorified, not Hodges. Yeah. Bishop, 
Thank you. Man, it's my joy. I love you, love and you, I love Encounter Church anytime yes, sir. you call. Answer is always yes. Y'all, I'm so impressed. I'm so proud of y'all. Wow. Whew, man, I'm going to be sitting in the audience one day and say, well, I knew him. <laughs> I, I did know them. I knew them from years ago. Appreciate you. Y'all, Dr. Brian Keith Hodges. It gives me great joy to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing we don't we, we, no we can't do it y'all that, that's it we're good man, we're, we love y'all man